Uh, thank you. Now, at this time, please mute your mics just so the um, basic, best sound experience. Otherwise, feedback could interfere with the information sharing. I'm going to go ahead and send you the guys the link for the people who want to go to the Matt, Matt 1324. This is the link right here. Here we go. Without further ado, uh, I'm going to go ahead and pass it out to Ms. Ivechuca, Mr. Ruben Carrizales, and Mr. Arbert Lizasi in the other room through the, uh, through the link I sent. Let me go ahead and pass it out to you guys. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so we want to give those students that want to do the um, math happy hour for the 1324 by clicking on the link that you see on the chat. So we'll give a couple of seconds for, for all of you to go ahead and transfer to that other room. If you are going to stay for the uh, math 1314, you don't have to click on anything. Just stay, stay tuned. Okay, very good. So, so welcome everyone again to Friday Happy Math Hour. And today we are going to be covering inverses and factoring. Okay. So, inverses. What is an inverse? So, inverse is you can. I, I like to think of it as 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 the opposite of a function. So, when we covered functions. Um, and we wanted to check to see if a function was a function graphically, we would do, we would do a vertical line test. So now um, to test for a function's inverse, we are going to uh, perform a horizontal line test. So when we were doing functions, we did a vertical line test to check that every X value referred to its own Y value. Now for the opposite, for the inverse function, we are going to test every y value has its own x value. Okay. All right. So we're going to use this table um, to verify our inverse function. So we have these inputs. Um, for x, we're going to use negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2. So for our function, when we plug in the value negative 3, okay, we get an output of 10, negative 2, 0, negative 1, negative 10, and so on and so forth. Okay? So when we do our solution okay, for our inverse function, you see here um, when we have negative 3 for our function and our output is 10, okay, it's, it's the opposite order when we're looking at our inverse function. You see it's way here at the end, okay? So when our input was 10, our output was negative three. So, and if I, if I go down the list, okay? When our input for our function was negative two, our output was zero. For our inverse function, when our input was zero, our output is negative two, and so on and so forth, okay? So please um, ask any questions if something is not clear. All right, so let's look at these graphs. And now again, I'll give a couple of seconds just so you all can um, perform as stated before. If we want to verify that these graphs have an inverse, we are going to provide, uh, perform a horizontal line test. Okay. So, Let's look at this graph here first that looks like a um, part of a semicircle, right? So if we did an imaginary horizontal line, we would see that this line um, would cross at two points. So hence, this graph does not have an inverse because it's crossing at two points. We have uh, a single y value, let's say this y value two, we refer to two um, x values, you know, it would refer to positive eight and negative eight. So it fails the horizontal line test. Well, what about the second graph, okay? So this, we have a line here, and if we would perform our horizontal line test, again, as we traverse, you know, up this graph or down, however you want to uh, do the horizontal line test, you see that our imaginary horizontal line will only cross the graph only once, you know, positive four would only refer to a positive two, you know, the value two, y value two would refer to more or less the value six. So this graph right here does have an inverse. 
So if you want to verify that a graph has an inverse, you would perform a horizontal line test. Okay. All right. So let's verify, given these two functions, um, if they are inverses of each other. So um, we're going to both check graphically and um, algebraically. Okay. All right. So we are given this function f, which is the square root of x plus 4. And we're given function g, which is equal to x squared minus 4. Now, this value here, or this representation, mathematical representation here, um, is very important because it's telling us that x has to be greater than or equal to 0. Now, why is that? Well, we know that it, we are dealing here with a square root. And this x, when we any value that we put in here, cannot make this um, equation less than 0. It means it cannot be a negative number, because we, if we have the square root of a negative number, we have an imaginary number or a number that does not exist. Okay, All right. So let's go ahead and um, solve or verify that these two functions are inverses of each other. And to do that, what we're going to do is what we're going to we're going to use something that we learned back in um, chapter 1.8. We're going to use our composite functions, right? We're going to use f composed of g and g composed of f. And if these f composed of g gives us the value x and g composed of x also gives us the value x, then this means that both function f and g are inverses of each other, okay? All right, so <clears throat> a little quick review. I always like to rewrite this syntax of f composed of g um, in this format um, because I it shows me clearly that I have this function f that for every x value, I'm going to put in another function, okay? All right, so if you see here, the outermost function is f, so that's what I do first. I write function f. Function f is the square root of x plus 4. Then everywhere I see x, I'm going to um, plug in x squared minus 4. Okay? So let's go ahead and do that. So when we do this, we have the square root of x squared minus 4 um, plus 4. Okay? And we subtract minus 4 plus 4. We combine our like terms. We have 0, leaving us with the square root of x squared. And we can simplify, right? We can say that the square root of a square um, cancels out or becomes 1, okay? which is going to leave us for x. So this gave us the composite function of f composed of g gave us the answer x. So now let's do the opposite, g composed of x, to see if we get x again. Okay. So again, we rewrite it as g composed of f. That means that everywhere I see x on function g, I'm going to plug in this function f. Okay. So function g is x squared minus 4. And everywhere I, I, I see x, I'm going to plug in function f, which is going to give me the square root of x plus 4 squared minus 4, okay? So the square root will cancel with the square, leaving me with just x plus 4 minus 4, and combine our like terms, plus 4 minus 4 is going to be 0, and 0 plus x is just x. So using composite functions, we were, at ver we were able to verify that function f is an inverse of function g and vice versa. Function g is an inverse of function f. Any questions? Very good. All right. So let's check graphically. Okay. So here, the graph of this function, uh, function f, which is the square root of x plus 4, we have this graph that has somewhat of a curve like this. Again, to verify that this has a function, what we would do is we would perform the vertical uh, horizontal line test. Right? So if we did an imaginary horizontal line, we would see that our imaginary horizontal line would only cross our graph only once. Okay. Now, um, 
for this graph, x squared minus 4. Uh-oh. If we were to graph this, okay, um, the original one, we would see that it doesn't have um, an inverse. But remember what we had said before, that this piece of information was very important, that we were only going to look at the values that are greater than um, 0 for x, right? So we are not interested in this left-hand side, right? So this is going to allow us to be only look at this portion over here. So now if we perform our horizontal line test, we would see that this has an, in, uh, an inverse. So again, the restriction on our domain is very important when we're looking at inverses. Okay. All right, so <clears throat> now if we were looking at both of these, okay, do um, you see that both of these are reflected on what's called our xy axis, okay? Um, and they are opposites of each other. So again, showing that these two graphs vertically have an inverse and they're opposites of each other um, help us show that these two functions are inverses of each other. So let's go ahead and do this example. Determine whether the function has an inverse. And if it does, find the inverse. All right? So let's go ahead and do this. Does the function pass the horizontal line test? So let's go ahead and graph this function. So I can tell that this is a linear function because my exponent on my x is just a 1. Um, and it's in what's called slope-intercept form of a function, right? where my y-intercept is 9 and my slope is 5. So I'm able to graph this. Um, oh, so before I graph it, let's go ahead and, and find its inverse, OK? So as I mentioned to you before, um, the inverse of a function is opposite of a function. So when we were checking to see a function is a function, we would check that every x value has its own y value. And for the inverse function, we want to check that every y value has its own x value. So if we want to find the inverse of a uh, function, what we want to do is the first step is replace the notation of the function with the equation. If you recall, the f of x is taking the place of the y value, right? So the first thing that I would do is change the f of x to y, okay? And then what I'm going to do is because I want to find the inverse, I'm going to swap the variables. I'm going to make all the y's into x and all the x into y's. Okay? So I've done this. Then I'm going to solve for y. Okay? So the first thing I would do is I would subtract 9 on both sides. So plus 9 minus 9 is 0. Move that to the other side. It's going to give me x minus 9. Then I'm going to divide both sides by 5, okay? Um, and when I divide 5 by 5 is 1, and then this gives me x minus 9 divided by 5 is equal to y. Now, this is just an equation, okay? So to signify that I have found the inverse function, I'm going to replace y with this notation, f to the um, exponent of negative 1. Okay, so this is the notation for inverse. So our inverse function, oops, we're missing the little negative here. It's supposed to be negative, okay? Um, so my inverse function is x minus 9 over 5, okay? So oh, here we go. Now we have it good. All right, let's do this example. Let me give you guys a, a, a few seconds to work it out, and find its inverse. All right, so the function passes the horizontal line test. Again, just like the first example before, um, we know that this is a um, squared function, but here, our restriction on our domain, we want our domain uh, for the x values to be greater than or equal to negative 6. This will, will allow us only to look at half of the parabola, making it have 
a an inverse okay so the, we're going to write our function f of x is equal to the square of x plus 6. I'm going to replace the f of x with y. Okay, again, I'm going to swap the variables. Everywhere I see a y, it's going to become an x, and every x is going to become a y. Then I'm going to solve for y. Okay, so the first thing is to take the square root of both sides. The square root of the square, um, you can think of it as that they cancel each other out, leaving me with just the square root of x on the left side. Okay, and this leaves me with y plus 6. I'm going to subtract 6 on both sides. It's going to give me the square root of x minus 6 is equal to y. Again, this is just the equation, but to identify it as the inverse function, I'm going to replace now the y with the f to the exponent negative 1. Okay, so when I do this, the inverse of the function f of x is equal to x plus 6 squared is the f to the negative 1 x equals to the square root of x minus 6. And again, with this restriction, that x has to be a value greater than or equal to negative 6. Pretty easy, yes? All right, let's move on. Okay, so let's um, move to factoring. Now, factoring is very, very important, and especially in our math class, in order to find um, x-intercepts to better be able to graph our, our, our equations. So um, we are going to be solving later on in, in your math class, in, in your Math 1314, you're going to be solving quadratic equations. And one of the easiest ways to solve for these equations is always by factoring, okay? All right, so let me give you an example here, okay? So here we have um, a graph of a parabola, okay? And again, this came from a quadratic equation, and it's right here. We have negative x squared minus 2x plus 8, okay? And here on the graph, we've labeled, you know, the vertex, which is negative 1, 9, and we labeled is x-intercepts, okay? So our x-intercepts are, um, you'll hear it as far as when you're doing homework, you're, they're going to ask you to find the solutions of this graph, find the zeros of this graph, or the roots of this graph. Um, so again, there's several ways of doing it, but the, the best way and the simplest way always to, to find these x-intercepts or these solutions is by factoring. So if you see here, if I have this graph, again, um, this equation, y is equal to negative x squared minus 2x plus 8, okay? I can factor this out, and um, I can use my zero property that says when I have two values that are being multiplied to each other equal to zero, this tells me that either this part is a zero or this is a zero. So if I don't see that right away, I can separate, separate separate them, where I have negative x minus 4 is equal to 0, or um, x minus 2 is equal to 0. So here, if I would do my, my algebra, okay, I add 4 on both sides, multiply by a negative 1 on both sides, it shows me that x is equal to negative 4. And on this one, to solve for x, I add 2 on both sides, and x is equal to 2. So you see I have the solutions here, where um, this graph crosses the x-axis at to zero where my y value was zero and um, negative four zero again my y value was zero okay so it's a very quick and good way to find solutions of a graph find the zeros of the graph find the intercepts of a quadratic equation okay all right so let me show you here some factoring steps okay so the first and most simplest way we can factor out a polynomial is by factoring its greatest common factor. And what this means is it's the highest factor that that is visible throughout the polynomial, okay? Um, the second is determining the number of factors, okay? So there's several cases. So if we have two terms, it could be a perfect square, okay? Or um, it could be a prime. What this means is that it's not factorable. 
okay? Um, we also have perfect cubes, okay? Um, on this one, we do have, uh, on, this, on the perfect squares, I um, hope you see that this is called a difference of squares, but there's no sum of squares, okay? It's, it's prime. But for cubes, we do have a um, difference of cubes and a sum of cubes, okay? So the difference of cubes is given by this factorization, and the sum of cubes is given by this factorization. So if we have three terms, and it's the one that we're probably going to use more in our Math 1314 class, is when we have a, a simple polynomial where our leading coefficient here is 1, okay? So when we have a simple um, polynomial with a, with a leading coefficient of 1, we can factor these. Um, and again, I'll, I'll show you my way of factoring technique as far as how to find these two factors for this, okay? And this, when we have three terms, okay, um, sometimes we have to do something that's called factor by grouping. And this is when my our leading coefficient, a, is not one, okay? It's something other than one, okay? And then the last way, when we have four terms, it's always by grouping, okay? All right, so let's look at some of these examples of factoring. Okay, so um, actually, before I get to this, um, let's review some vocabulary. Okay, so a quadratic expression is an expression involving its terms. What does that mean? That means that my highest exponent on my equation is a two. Okay, so you see here, I have x squared minus x minus twelve. The highest exponent is a two. Same thing with this one. This one is the x squared minus 4. My high, highest exponent is a 2. And then on this, um, this equation, negative 3x squared minus 4x minus 2, again, my highest exponent is a 2. Okay. So factors are numbers that multiply together to get another number. Okay. All right. So examples of our our factors are 12, right? So if, if I wanted to see what are all the factors of 12, so I can do a list, okay? So what will give me 12? Well, 1 times 12 gives me 12. 2 times 6 gives me 12. 3 times 4 gives me 12. So all of the factors that give me 12 would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, and 12. Okay, so again, factors are numbers that are multiplied together to get another number. All right, so why don't you take a few seconds and write or list all the factors for 20. I'll give you a few seconds. All right, so let's do this list again. I always like to start with the easiest one, one times the number, right? So one times 20 will give me 20. Um, I also can get 20 by two times 10 will give me 20. And four times five will give me 20. So the factors of 20 or the numbers that will give me 20 are one, two, four, five, 10, and 20. Yes? Excellent. Okay. So to get the greatest common factor, okay, or GCF, so GCF is a set of numbers which is the largest factor that all the numbers share. So let's look at an example, okay? Um, what is the greatest common factor or of 12 and 20? So let's do, since we did the work already for 12, okay? Um, let's see. If we list all the factors are 12, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, and 12. Okay, all the factors of 20 are 1, 2, 4, 5, 10, and 20. We see that we have some that are shared. We share the 1, we share the 2, we share the 4. But which is the greatest common factor that is shared by both 12 and 20? So the greatest factor is 4. 4 is the greatest factor that's equal to both 12 and 20 for this example. Yes? All right. 
let's let me give you a few seconds to do these two numbers. Okay. What is the greatest common factor of 20 and 30? Okay, so again, we did the list for 20, so we kind of have half of the work already, but we, um, we can do the list of 30 if, if we don't know it, okay? So we can do one times 30, um, two times 15, three times 10, um, five times six, right? So we list them, okay? Um, so which is the number that is shared by both that is the greatest value for both, okay? So if we see here that the greatest value um, that both of them share is this 10. So the GCF of 20 and 30 is 10. Yes? Any questions? Very good. Okay. Now, what is the GCF of x squared and x cubed? Oh, we don't have any numbers here, but we see that um, we have variables. We can think of x squared as two x's multiplied to each other, right? X times x is giving me x squared. Uh -huh. X cubed is I have three x's. I have x times x times x, right? So if I can, I can list them just like the way I did with my with my numbers, okay? I can list the x squared. Again, x squared is made out of two x's. X cubed is made out of three x's. So the greatest common factor for x squared and x cubed is they both share two x's, right? So my greatest common factor for um, between x squared and x cubed would be the x squared because they share both the two x's. Any questions? Okay. So in both we have the same variables or this, the way the best way also when we are looking at um, no numbers and just the variables, the smallest degree of the x's is going to be your greatest common factor. Okay, so it's just a observation and little advice or hint. Okay. All right, let's do this one, last one together with me. Okay, what is the GCF of 20x squared and 30x squared. So now we have um, variables and numbers, okay? So we, we can do a little um, backwards work, right? We, we already did the GCF for 20 and 30, um, and we know that that was 10. And also, now that we look at the x squared and x cubed, okay? We see, we see again, again, we had done that work already, but we know that the 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 smallest exponent of the x squared, so that's my greatest common factor. So the GCF between 20x squared and 30x cubed is going to be just the 10x squared, okay? So it's the value of 10 from my numbers 20 and 30 and the x squared from my variables. Any questions? Okay, so again, just to sum up our GCF for 20x squared and 30x cubed, we would factor out a 10x squared, okay? All right, Ms. Chica, would you like us to, to help us with this example? Yes, sure. How's everybody doing? So um, let me just go one slide back. And as um, Mr. Carrizales was saying, um, we did these in, in separate little pieces. But um, the questions that you'll be asked also is to factor out the greatest common factor of 20x squared plus 30x cubed. So previously, um, you found the factors of 20 and 30. You found the GCF. Then you found the GCF of x squared, x cubed. So once you know the uh, greatest common factor of the 20x squared and 30x cubed, you can factor out the 10x squared. So what does it mean to factor? Um, one way you can think about it is 
let me get my pin here really quick, is have this term. You can take your GCF, and basically what you're doing is dividing each term by 10x squared. So 20 divided by 10 is going to give you a 2, and the x squared divided by x squared is um, just going to be 1. So that's where this 2 comes from. And then 30 divided by 10 is 3. x cubed divided by x squared would be x. And so that's where this comes from. Um, or you can also, let me go back. Ask yourself, um, 10x squared is our GCF, so we write it out here. And then you say 10x squared times what? 20x squared. So that's going to be a 2. And then 10x squared times what would give me a 30. That would be a 3x. Okay, so we'll be doing these as we go on. And so here it wants us to factor out the GCF again. So if we look at both terms, you can see that they have something in common. They both have a 2x minus 5 in common. And so that's actually going to be your GCF. And so if we factor that out, we would write it in the front. So here I wrote it on the front. And then we want to know what's going to go in that parentheses. So imagine if I could lift this up and pull them out to the front, then what would be left? We would only have the x, the plus sign, and the 2 left. So um, that would be our other factor. So here we would have our 2x minus 5, which was our GCF. And whatever was left in the, in the problem here is the x plus 2. Okay, so this factored is going to be equal to this. Okay, so um, another, so that's always the first thing you want to do is ask yourself, can I factor out a greatest common factor? And if you can, you want to go ahead and do that because it's going to make the problem 98% of the time, it's going to make it a lot easier to work with than if you don't factor out a GCF, if it's available. So if you don't have a GCF, then if you have four terms, here we have four terms, one, two, three, four, then we're going to use something called grouping. Okay. And so basically what you want to do is group the terms into two groups. So I circled the first two terms as one group in red and the second two terms as another group in green. Um, you can combine them in different ways, but usually the first two go together and then the second, the last um, two go together but you can um, switch them around if it doesn't work out. So we look at the first group, 2x squared minus 5x, and if we look at the numbers, the coefficients, 2 and 5, um, we cannot factor out anything from 2 and 5. The only number they have in common is going to be 1, so we don't worry about the 2 and 5, but we have an x squared and we have an x. So the greatest common factor of x squared and x is going to be um, x. So if we factor out an x in the front, then I'm going to have x times 2x gives me a 2x squared, and x times negative 5 will give me a negative 5x. So that's going to be your first step, is to factor um, the first two terms. Now, the, the good thing about grouping is that our goal is going to be to end up with something that looks like this problem here, where this parentheses is the same as this parentheses. And so if I go back, whatever I got, I'm going to use this as um, for my second group as well. So I'm going to go ahead and write it there. And now I'm going to look at the 4x and the 10. So here I have a 4 and I have a 10. So they do have some factors in common. Um, for 4, we get 1, 2, and 4. And for 10, we get 1, 2, and 5. So the greatest common factor is going to be 2. So if I place my 2 in front, notice that um, I already have my 2x here. But if I was to factor out a 2 from here, then we do get the 2x, and then we do get the uh, negative 5. So I always like to check um, to make sure that this parentheses that I'm using here is going to indeed produce um, what I have here in my last two terms. So 2 times 2x is 4x. 2 times negative 5 is negative 10. Now between them, you have a plus sign. Okay, so that's going to play a role here in a second. So we want to use that plus sign to separate the two groups. And so now notice that you have the 2x minus 5. 
and the 2x minus 5, so we can factor that out. So if I factor this out, then the only thing I have left is this x and this 2. So I'm going to end up with x plus 2 times 2x minus 5. And so this um, polynomial here with four terms, in, if we factor it, would be equal to this right here. Okay. So let me repeat the steps again. Um, so if you have four terms, automatically you want to think about grouping. And you can um, group them in the first two together and then the second two. Factor it out. Whatever you get in parentheses here, um, you want to go ahead and use it for your second group. And then you can factor out the rest um, by looking or the variables. And so in this case, we just factor out a 2. Um, once you do that, whatever is in the parentheses, that's what's going to be and you take whatever is left over, the x, the plus sign, and the 2 will be your second parentheses. And we'll try a couple of more here. So here we have factor um, this polynomial. So you want to ask yourself, do I have a greatest common factor? So that's the first thing that you want to ask yourself. Well, I have a 2, an 8, a 3, and a 12. Well, the 2 and the 3, the only thing they have in common is the 1. And so if we put those with 8 and 12, they're all only going to have a 1 in common. So there's no greatest common factor for the entire polynomial. But I have four terms, so that tells me that I can um, use grouping instead. And so I'm going to have a group 1 and then a group 2. So for group 1, we're going to look at the factoring the 2 and the 8, or the factors of 2 are 1 and 2. The factors of 8 are 1, 2, and 4, and 8. So the greatest common factor would be the 2. And then we have x squared and x. So the greatest common factor of x squared and x, as Ruben mentioned, variable with the smallest uh, power or the smallest degree, in this case, x. So together, the 2 and the x is going to give us the greatest common factor. And so if I factor a 2x out of here, we get 2x and 2x times 4 will give me 8x. Okay, so that one's taken care of. Now for my second group, we want to use the same uh, parentheses, the x plus 4. We're going to use that for group number 2. So we have um, the factors of 3 and 12. So 1, 3, 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, and 12. The greatest of those is going to be 3. So I write it down here. I'm already going to use this right here. So I have my, my um, parentheses here. But if you don't write it, it's OK, um, as, as long as you factor out the 3. So if you take um, 3 times x, that will give you 3x. And 3 times 4, uh, 4 is going to be a 12. OK, so let's put it together. So here's the original problem. And so by grouping, now I have the first set from group one, which was 2x times x plus 4. And then what I got for group two, which is 3x plus um, 4. What do they have in common? x plus 4 and x plus 4. So I can factor that out to the front. And the things that I'll have left after I do that is going to be the 2, the plus sign, and the 3. So that gives you your second parentheses. So now this whole polynomial factor will be x plus 4 and 2x plus 3. OK, so let me go back to this one. Is there any questions on uh, factoring by grouping? And as Mr. Carizales mentioned, factoring plays a big role in Chapter 2 as we're going to be um, solving quadratic equations and polynomials that are um, greater than uh, degree 2. So something else that you might run into is a polynomial that only has two terms. So you might see it as x squared minus y squared, or you might see it as x squared plus y squared. So if you run into a term that has x squared minus y squared, then we can factor this out as x minus y and x plus y. And the reason is if we have x times x, we get the x squared. And then if we have x times uh, positive y, we get an xy. And if we multiply 
so we get an xy. If we multiply negative y times x, then we get a negative yx. And so this right here is just going to be 0. And so then we have negative y times y, which would be negative y squared. Okay. So if you have um, perfect squares, then we can factor out as this. But if you have a plus sign instead of a subtraction sign, then we say that the um, that this is going to be prime, which just means that um, it's not factorable. You cannot factor it. Okay, so just a review of what are perfect squares. Um, perfect squares are basically, if you have a number like 4, um, you can multiply the same number 2 times 2, and it's going to give you 4, or 3 times times 4 is 16, 10 times 10, 100, and so on. And so notice that the 2 times 2, I can write it as 2 squared. That would be like your y squared here. If you have x to the fourth, that's the same as x squared times x squared. And so this table here, you can um, keep in mind as we answer some of these. So x squared minus 1 will factor as x times x minus 1 plus 1, right? So you'll see a little pattern here x squared minus 4 would be x times x. The 4 is a perfect square, which is going to be 2 and 2. 1 would be minus and 1 would be uh, a plus sign. So x squared minus 9, the 9 is the same as 3 squared, so we're going to use negative 3 and a positive 3. So I have a couple of more here. So just take a, a minute or two and try some of these. And then I'll click so that you can see the, the answers. So I'll give you like maybe a minute. Okay, so x squared minus 49. Um, if you like, you can put your answer in the in the chat, and then um, we can, uh, or I'll just click so we can see the answers. Okay, so we have x minus 7, x plus 7, x squared minus 81. 81 would be 9 times 9. Again, 1 is negative, 1 is positive. x squared minus 100, x minus 10, x plus 10. And now here is a little bit different, right? Good job, um, Rocio. So here we have 25x squared minus 36y squared. So if we didn't have the 25 and we didn't have the 36, then you would end up with x squared minus y squared. Look at the um, 25 first. 25 is a perfect square, which is 5 squared. So that's going to give me, um, I can write a 5 here and a 5 here for the 25. The x squared would be x and x. Um, I have a, a subtraction, so one is going to be negative and one is going to be positive. And then for 36, I get 6 times 6. So I would have my 6 and my positive 6. And then y squared would be y and y. Okay, so x to the fourth minus 16. Again, x to the fourth is just x squared times x squared. So we can write x squared here times x squared gives me the x to the fourth. And the 16 is a perfect square, and we can use um, minus 4 and plus 4. But then you want to check these parentheses. x squared minus 4 is the same as this one, so we can write it as x minus 2 times x plus 2. And then the x squared plus 4, remember that is going to be prime. So your final answer should be, we should add the, oops, let me go back. So your final answer here is going to be x squared plus 4. So this is your final answer. OK, so those are your perfect squares. Now, the ones that we run into quite a bit is whenever you have um, three terms like this one. And so you know, we some of us call it easy factoring. Um, and it's only because you don't rewrite it to do something else with it. And so first, let's work on the signs. Um, so here, we're going to be looking at the constant C. 
if it's a positive C, then we're going to use the same signs in the parentheses. So you're going to have two parentheses, and they're either going to both be positive or they're go both going to be negative. If the C is negative, then they're either going to be um, they're going to be different signs. So one is positive, one is negative, or vice versa. One is negative, one is positive. Okay. So here, let's just look at the signs. So the first one, x squared minus 10x plus 24. We look at the 24, and we want to know what kind of signs will it have. Well, since it's positive, then it's going to have the same signs. Okay. So number two. Since it's negative, um, a constant, negative 30, that means that your signs are going to be different. And then here we have a negative, so that would be different, and then this would be the same. Again, so what I mean by that is when you do your parentheses, you're going to have x. The signs are the same, right? So in this case, they're both negative, or they'll both be positive. And we'll talk about um, how do we decide which one is which. So for example, let's say you wanted to do x squared minus 10x plus 24. We look at the C. That tells you that it's the same sign. And so now you look at the bx. Since this is negative, then we're going to use two negatives. Okay, They're both the same. We use both negative because of this one. Your next step is to find the factors of C, in this case 24. So the factors here. So they, they both have to be negative. I can write negative 1 times negative 24, negative 2 times negative 12, negative 3 times negative 8, negative 4 times negative 6. So those are your factors. So the third step is to look at these factors. And if you add or subtract them, you want to see which one will, will give you the bx term. So the bx is going to be the one with the x, right? So in our situation, the bx term is negative 10x. So which of these um, factor pairs will give us a negative 10? So if I add these, negative 1 plus negative 24 gives me negative 25, negative 2 plus negative 12, negative 14, and um, so on. So we can see that negative 4 plus negative 6 would give me that negative 10, which is going to be what I need so that it can match my bx term. So what we do next is we're going to use these two numbers to fill in the parentheses. So, so far, we have the x times the x is x squared. We know the signs are the same. And so all I have to do now is just bring these two numbers into my parentheses. So I have my negative 4 and my negative 6, and I place them in my parentheses. And now we have that this polynomial is factored, and the factored form is x minus 6 times x minus 4. So let's try a few more. So here, um, x squared minus 7x minus 30, you have a negative um, c. That tells me that I'm going to have different signs. And so um, I'm going to have a negative here and a positive here. Well, what if Mr. Carizales decided he wants to put a positive here and a negative here? And that's OK. OK, but I just find it easier to bring this sign here down and then I know they have to be different, so I make this one a plus sign. The next thing is factor the C. In this case, we have a negative 30, so we're going to factor the C. The signs have to be different. And you don't have to do all of this, what I did here. Um, as you get more practice, then you can do a lot of this, um, I guess, like in, in your mind. But I went ahead and listed them so you can see um, what the process is. So. Since the signs have to be the same, I could have positive 1 times negative 30, or I could switch it as negative 1 times positive 30, and then 2 times negative 15, negative 2 times 15, and so on. So if I add or subtract, which of these will provide the bx term? What is our bx term? Negative 7x. So we're looking for the two factors that's going to give us a negative 7, and that's going to be 3 times negative 10, because if I add 3 plus negative 10, I get a negative 7. So we found our winner, right? So this is going to be our match. And so now we can just um, fill in the, the parentheses. I'm going to have a negative 10 and a positive 3. 
Now, if you're not sure if you're doing this correctly, then go ahead and multiply um, the two parentheses out, or some of you know it as FOIL, you can multiply x times x, x squared, x times 3x is 3x, minus 10x is negative 7x, and negative 10 times 3 is negative 30. Okay, so let me go to the next one. Here we have uh, x squared plus x minus 20. This is gonna be different signs. How do I know? Because there's a negative um, in front of the C, in this case, 20. So I know one is positive, one is negative. Get the factors of 20. So one times negative 20, negative one times 20, um, and so on. Our bx term in this case is a positive 1x. So we're looking for the two factors that would give us a 1 if we add or subtract. So 1 plus negative 20, negative 19. So negative 4 plus um, 5 is going to be that 1. Okay, so that's going to be our match. So I'm going to use a x plus 5 and an x minus 4. Okay, example number 4. Um, this is positive, so we need the same sign. Since this is positive, I'm going to have a positive and a positive. Um, get the factors for 15. 1 and 15, 3 and 5. Which one would give me the 8? Um, the 3 and 5. Okay, so that's um, a few examples of factoring um, x squared plus bx plus c. However, it's not always nice and simple like this, right? This is why it's called the easy one. Um, because then they throw in a number in front of the x squared, okay? And it's still going to be easy, especially if you understand the grouping part of it, okay? So let's look at this really quick. Um, the steps here are, if you have a number in front, you can do a guess and check, like you can guess on the, on the parentheses, but that could become frustrating, um, especially if you keep changing the signs. And so just a method that would work all the time is grouping. And then there's some other methods out there um, that you could look up. Um, I never learned those when I was in high school um, or even in college. Um, I kind of saw them till after I graduated from college. And so I just kind of stick to what I do, um, what I did use growing up and when I was in college, which I was still growing up in college, I guess. But anyways. Um, so the first thing you want to do is you're going to multiply the a times c. and once you multiply a times c you're going to find the factors and then we're going to rewrite we're going to choose the two factors that give you the bx term but we're going to rewrite the, that bx term with those factors okay so let me show you an example it's usually um, better with an example so we take the three the number in front of x squared which is a so three times our constant which is 10 give me a 30. So my next step is find the factors of 30. So 1 times 30, um, 2, 15, 3, and 10, 5, and 6, those are all factors of 30. My bx term is 11x, okay? So if I add or subtract, which of these would give me an 11? Well, if I add 5 and 6, I'll get 11, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take 5 and 6, and so the term 11x, instead of writing 11x, we're going to write it as 5x plus 6x. And so what I mean by that is we're going to take our original problem, 3x squared plus 11x plus 10. And instead of 11x, we're going to write 3x squared plus 6x plus 5x, and then plus 10. Okay. And now you have four terms, right? So you might be thinking, well, this just got bigger instead of better. But um, in this case, if it's bigger, um, it might be better because you can uh, use grouping. So now we can take the first group, um, 3x squared plus 6x. So the 3 and the 6, the greatest common factor for that is 3. x squared and x, the greatest common factor for that is x. So I can factor out a 3x. 3x times x, 3x squared, 3x times 2 is 6x. Um, the shortcut here is x plus 2 is what I'm going to use on this side. And now I look at my coefficients, 5 and 10. They have a 5 in common, so 5x, 5 times x is 5x, 5 times 2 is 10. 
And so now they have x plus 2 is in common to x plus 2. So I can factor that out. What do I have left? 3x plus 5. Okay. So this is going to be um, the original. Uh, let me go back. So your original polynomial can be factored as x plus 2 times 3x plus 5. Okay, let me do this one. 2 times 9 or negative 9 is negative 18. We get all the factors. Okay, um, notice that this is a negative, so my signs will be different. And that's why I wrote them twice. Okay, and my bx term is negative 3x, which is right here. So if I add or subtract, um, which of them will give me a negative 3x? And that's going to be this guy here. So that's my match. So instead of negative 3x, we're going to write it as 3x minus 6x. And I, I represented that in blue here. So I can factor this group 1, the 2 and the 6. What do they have in common? A 2. And then the x and the x squared, the greatest common factor is an x. So I can factor out a 2x. So 2x times x is 2x squared. 2x times negative 3 is negative 6x. I'm going to use this parentheses over here, but I'm always going to check my work. So 3 and 9, um, the greatest common factor is a 3. Since I have a plus sign here, this would be a plus 3 times x is 3x. 3 times negative 3 is negative 9. I always like to check just to make sure. And then here, x minus 3, x minus 3, we can factor it out. So I'm left with 2x plus 3. Oh, and that was the last slide. So um, what I'm going to do is, uh, just to let you know, if you're going to watch this, if you were watching this video a different day than today, um, in the survey, you can just enter the answer for, let me find the problem over here. For number um, three and four on slide 98. Um, for those of you that are here, you don't have to enter an answer. You can just say, I attended the live session. And once this posts up, um, I will send the link to my classes. And if, if you're one of my students here, um, I'll also provide uh, the link for the happy hour from the spring semester where we reviewed for the exam one. So that will help you as exam one is coming up for you guys. Um, so thank you, Ruben, and um, the rest of the staff for um, helping us today. And uh, let me share the sign-in sheet. Make sure you sign in today to get credit. And I will send it to you, Ms. Aguirre. And um, I guess that's it for today. Um, if you have any questions, remember that you can stay here. And um, you can ask the tutors questions, and they'll just take you and help you with whatever questions you might have. Thank you, everybody. We'd like to invite you to next week's TVE. We'll be covering Math 1314 standard form of quadratic equations and graphing for 1314 and for Math 1324 system of equations. We hope you have a wonderful summer semester and know that online tutoring is going to be open and here for you. Thank you so much, Mr. Carizales and Ms. Chica for presenting today. And thank you, audience, for coming and being such a wonderful group. And we hope to see you again soon. And don't forget, if you have any questions, the tutors are here to assist. <laughs>